Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the thing that I, I realized, for people that are not realizing, uh, who are watching this interview right now, it's five in the morning and you guys are wide awake. I'm joking. It's, <laughs> it's very early in the morning here in Toronto. Uh, and you guys, what, flew in yesterday? I did, yeah. Yeah, and I flew in the day before yesterday. Okay, so, but you're both like, ahead of where we are right now. Yes, we're actually in the future. We're, we're traveling back. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, wait, wait, actually, I have a lot of things I want to talk to you about, but the only reason I get to, the only reason Collider gets to be here at the Toronto Film Festival is because uh, of great sponsors. I want to give a huge thank you to Nordstrom Canada for being an awesome sponsor and allowing us to cover movies like yours. Um, so jumping right on in, uh, first of all, a uh, great job on the movie. It is, uh, do you find it is easier to, I don't know if a movie like this, it's so much harder in America to make films like this now because everything is more escapist fare and it's harder and harder to get financing to tell s stories like this. How was it for you guys to, to, was it tough to get this film off the ground? Um, I think we're very blessed to, to live in a country that supports the arts uh, f from the government. So of course there's a lot of room for experiment and to make uh, more extreme stories or more provocative stories. So we did work on it for a long time, but that was also because we wanted to be to the script to be like really good before we started. And because we, I'm a first time director and this is our very first movie that we also co-produce as a company. So that's why, but the, I think the country has a lot of money for arts and I think that is beautiful and very important. Although this of course, as we say, was made for an apple and an egg. Um, so it was a low budget film. It's not like it's 50 million, obviously. Sure. And it, we shot it in 23 days. Okay. First of all, that's crazy and amazing. Uh, but you know something I realized that uh, like most of the people watching the interview right now will not have seen it yet. So how have you been describing the friends, the, the film to friends and family? You're a good pitcher. Here we go. Well, <laughs> I just keep it very short. It's about like a prison and in that prison works a psychotherapist who's very experienced. And she then falls in love, so to say, with the criminal that she's treating and he is a sex offender. Okay, that's, one of the, that's a good description. It's almost like you've practiced that. <laughs> that I did. <laughs> um, one of the things that I really enjoyed about the film is that y the audience is not given any easy answers. Like you are allowed, as an audience member, you're wondering what's going on. It's provoking you, making you think. Talk a little bit about the, uh, that aspect of the film and, and putting that in the script. Well, that's exactly what we were after, I think. Well, what, what you keep saying that uh, we started the film with a question, not so much with a with a statement, um, but you can say a bit more about that maybe. Well, I think um, when I heard about this story, because it's actually based on true events, this, I saw this the first time I ever thought of the idea was when I saw a news program where and, and they had an item which was called Love in Prison. So it was about relationships like this. And so then I was like, how is it possible that someone who studied, you know, f to, to be a therapist, who knows more than anybody else in the world what kind of uh, dangers there are in treating these people, how manipulative they can be, and still she falls for him. And I think in a smaller way you could say, like, why do we eat chocolate, like 10 bars of chocolate when we are sad? Why do we look at our phone all day when we shouldn't? Why do we smoke? Why do we, you know, take drugs? Why do we constantly do stuff that we know is destructive and still we do it? And of course this story is very extreme. But I think everybody can relate to addiction and toxic behavior. A hundred percent. No, I mean a hundred percent, you know? <laughs> what? What's yours? What? <laughs> What's your addiction? Uh, I, think, uh, I think, like you guys, uh, coffee. I also am a big fan of red wine. Yeah, I there get it. Right. I get it. Yeah. yeah. No, we're all driven. In, it's so weird. It's and that fascinates us, and and that's why. And also Paul Verhoeven that we both worked with when we were uh, acting in his film Black Book. He o he always said to me, if you want to make a movie, because I always had that dream. He said you have to have a question, a real, real, real question. And so I think this was our question: like, why, 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 why does she do this? That's so interesting. Uh, First of all, I have to say that uh, I'm a big fan of your work with Paul. Uh, uh, I wish, or I, I, I Paul you has. Be here right now. Listen, Paul. Paul's. I'm a. Big, he has made some movies that I absolutely adore, um, and so uh, I think he's a very talented filmmaker. Um, anyway, jumping into your guys's again. So you obviously don't. You have no matter what movie you're making, you never have enough time. You never have enough money on any film. Um, but so you're getting ready to start filming this thing. What are you most nervous to be able to pull off with the time and money you have? 
Well, the time and money was not, I mean, as an actor, I was just basically mo mostly focusing on how do I get this, how do I, how do I make this story compelling without people sort of rejecting the, the subject? Because how, how can I lure them in even though the character is not per se sympathetic immediately? Um, so that was a challenge for me. Uh, and, and I really liked that, that it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't presented on a plate. Like this is a, f you know, a fun, happy-go-lucky girl next door, fun, fun show. Um, you know, you have to work. And, uh, and I, and I, I love that. And, and, and working together was just for me a dream because I felt very safe, very, very um, inspired every day. I felt like she completely gets me. Uh, she trusts my instincts. I trust her instincts. So hence the title. Um, um, so yeah, that, that was more my focus. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm co-producing as well, but I was more focused on the acting, to be honest, in this. Sure. Which was a good thing, of course. Yeah, I, I yeah. agree. <laughs> no, for me, I think uh, because we had such a, a short amount of shooting days um, and l a very limited budget, um, which we both really wanted also because we thought that's the best way to learn. Because as you said, no matter what happens, you will always not have enough money. Sure. Um, so, but I think I prepared myself almost like a military person, you know. So in order to also because they're both like such great actors. I mean, the male lead is played by Marwan Kenzari, who's also like a big star. And so I really I, I, I wanted to be able to answer any question that they would have. And also for myself, uh, because it was my first film and I never went to film school, I just prepared like crazy for it in order to be like free together with them on the set and be intuitive on the set because we did our homework so well uh, I'm always actually I'm curious you guys seem like you get along so great you seem like BFFs what was the last like what was the last real fight you two had and over what have you had a real fight and what did you making the movie or in general? Uh, definitely not during the movie I think we were just like almost melting into each other. It was like, yeah, it was a really magical um, experience for me. And also you never know whether we, you're gonna, you're gonna feel sure. uncomfortable or whether it's weird for he, her to tell me what to do. And, but it was never like, it never felt like there was a hierarchy in, a, in any way. So you're saying uh, the last big fight was over where you went to lunch? Maybe there's something. I can't even small. remember. No, we don't really. We're not no, good at fighting. Not, no, we we are a little bit uh, avoiding the conflict. We just text them. There's a lot of yeah. It's always okay. over. The, over we know the it's phone. fine in the end, but yeah. Sure. Like, uh, yeah. One of the things that I, I love talking about is the editing process because that's the final rewrite. So I'm curious. You get in the editing room. You're looking at all your footage. What are you super excited about, and what are you absolutely terrified about? Because it was totally the first time for me to experience this whole process. Um, I was really happy with, for instance, there was one scene where she was dancing on her own, which I thought was just a, like a short movie by itself in her apartment. And I was so in love with that, but we had to let it go in the end because it was just not helping the story. And moments like that, I felt were very emotional where you really have to let go of some of the material that I still think, and other scenes mm. as well. There were actually a lot of, I'm really a fan of dance. So I, would, I wanted to make a lot of scenes in the movie where people started to dance. So I had more of these scenes and I, I almost all had to cut all of them because it was just not, it didn't fit into the story. Director's I had, cut. Yeah, and I had a great <laughs> editor, by the way. The editor also works with, Paul. Of course. So that was, I mean, it was great to have uh, a teacher like that, like somebody who knows everything, but yet I had to be careful to also really make it into what we wanted it to be, like, you know, and not, and not be too much influenced by everybody's experience. 100%. Have you seen Ex Machina? No. Oh, okay. I've, I've heard about it. Right. There's a, uh, there's a very famous gif of, of uh, Oscar Isaac dancing. And uh, it's gone, it's very like a viral gif of him doing like this dance. I need to see that. You, you do, yeah. because I was going to say that uh, after that dancing, which went viral, it's very hard to put dancing in movies because you have to compete with Oscar Isaac <laughs> in Ex Machina. Oh, this already sounds beautiful to me. I'm going to like immediately Google that and watch yeah, you'll, it. It'll come up immediately. Ex Machina, Oscar Isaac, something. Um, so anyway, so you, I forget what the final length of the movie is, but how long was your first cut compared to what people are going to see? Oh yeah, it was it was much much longer. I think it was like forty five minutes longer or something. It was really long. It was really long, 
And but I already because everybody warned me for the first time you see your movie. You have even on YouTube you can see all these really famous directors talk about that. Like okay, so when you see the first cut, you're gonna be so depressed. You're gonna. I didn't have that at all because I was not that I was proud of myself at all because I still saw like oh my god how are we gonna do this? But because I was so impressed by what the two of them did because I think what they did is so embarrassing, so vulnerable. So they went into places that are so hidden within yourself. So I think the performances are just, I mean, I can only, like I almost start to cry what, when I talk about it. <laughs> no, I really think they're both like, I, they feel like they're my children, you know? Like, sure. And it's because this is what happens when you are a director because you're looking at them for like a year constantly. So it feels like they're your flesh and blood, but they are both just my heroes. Uh, my last question for you, because we're about to switch. Uh, what was the last thing you cut out before the film got locked so the last sequence the well, thing that almost made it in the movie the thing that happens was that there's i'm gonna like tell this because i don't care uh this uh, there was like there's one scene where she goes to her uh she's sleeping she goes to the bathroom she returns and she sees suddenly a huge black dog sitting on her bed to me that is him who is in her room, but she is like a, 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 an illusion, you know, it's like a, almost like a dream or a nightmare. Uh, and everybody told me to cut that out. Like all the important men came into the editing room and were like, we're gonna cut out the dog. So I called her in the bathroom because she was in London shooting her TV show. And I was calling her, I'm like, they wanted to, to let the dog go. And she was very supportive, but we thought, well, okay, let's listen to them, not be too rebellious about it. So I let it go and then and then a week later, I was like, no, no, the dog has got to go back into it. And then I had to like sort of form an army of people that would support me <laughs> to get there. So now the dog is in the movie. Uh, I'm so I finally dog didn't team. let it go. Right. But it was out. It was Team totally Doberman. Out. Yeah. Right. You know, it's, it's interesting because some people lose that battle, especially on their first film. I know. You know, did, yeah. you, did you have a, t was it, was it an easy, did it? It was very tough, very emotional, uh, f uh, like a uh, fight, you know, a discussion, sure. heated discussion. But I do think we're very blessed again to live in a country where, as a director, especially if you make like a low budget art house movie like this, you are um, allowed to, 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 you know, be in control. But I did feel like you have to really, really know what you want. Because otherwise, of course, especially because I'm a first time director you are also very much impressed by everybody else who has so much experience. So to go back and to really go into that room and say, no, I'm going to keep the dog, is really hard. Mm. It's really hard because people will say things like, well, then this and this and this is going to happen. Or then, you know, nobody will like your movie or stuff like that. Completely. And I'm still happy because it's still people, yesterday after the uh, screening also, yeah. somebody made a, a, remor a remark about it. So it's still a little bit controversial, the dog in there. But I like it. Uh, I'm very curious. I'm a big fan of uh, your work, and I'm curious, how do you, do you have like a pre-shooting ritual? Do you like, how do you typically work on set? Because I've spoken to so many actors that talk about how they need silence, and others like to listen to music, and others like to do certain things. I'm just curious. Um, well, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I, I prepare by just learning my lines. <laughs> and so that, but I never learn them well enough. Like I always sort of keep, keep, some sort of stress around around it so that I feel like I'm, I'm not 100% sure what to do and, and I sort of thrive on that. So I, I like that sort of, it's like a writer who writes it, you know, has deadline writing, you know, does deadline writing, like can only write when, when there's like five minutes left. Um, I, so I, yeah, I'm, <coughs> know that. I understand this. Yeah. So I, I thrive on that sort of stress, N not per se healthy, but that sort of is my my way I, I do prepare in my head it's all very uh, intellectual like it's, there's a lot of stuff happening in my head beforehand and then I just want to be on set and feel completely free so at least I have thought about it a thousand times and then I just go but I've I, I sometimes tell this story about um, I had to do a play once where I played that my father had died and um, it was, uh, I don't know, no, half an hour before the premiere and some guy came up to me backstage and said, and I was just joking and I was just laughing and having fun with people and actors behind the, the, the stage. And the guy said, well, why are you not, you, you're going to do a really important, strong, uh, serious 
uh, role now. Like, why are you not prepared? Why are you not in the corner sitting con- concentrating? And I was like, oh, oh yeah, maybe I should. Oh yeah, of course, that's what actors do. I, I suppose I should be concentrating. And I went and I <laughs> retreated and I, was, I just sat somewhere in a corner and I sat there for five minutes. And I was like, no, that's not for me. I I can't do this. I. It's when the curtains open. It's when someone calls action. That's when I when my motor goes. I I, I don't know how else to explain it. Sure, I, I, it's, it's a it's very a long story for very short. Uh, no, no. But the, the thing is thing. that the only thing I've learned about from doing this for a very long time is that there's no right answer. That everyone needs to know what they're comfortable with and and. And what works it also best depends how you feel on the day. If you, it depends on what you have to do. I mean, if you have to open a door. I mean, I can do tr- car tricks just before. But of course, if if I have to act that I'm going to kill myself. Yes, it's a bit different, of course. Then I'm not going to be joking, maybe. But um, yeah, it all depends. So um, you're getting ready to film this, and I'm. Uh, what's the day? Do you? You're looking at the schedule. You're looking at the script. Is there anything that you, that's making you say, "Wow, that's going to be a really challenging day"? Oh yeah. <laughs> well, definitely in this film, there was many of those, um, very very intense scenes where the challenge is then to because it's so such rough emotions that you can't just you can't just act that you just have to go to go to that place because it gets really ugly if you don't if you don't um stay true to that feeling because otherwise it's really difficult to watch it's it's fake it's sort of so i felt like there was definitely a few scenes where i just had to completely turn myself upside down and inside out and have people look straight through me and it was yeah very it's very vulnerable um and there were days where i just had a lot of lines and i was like i need to be prepared this time (laughs) no not prepared but you know i need to really be uh, focused because it's 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 very um on the millimeter work kind of if you know what i mean completely um i definitely want to ask you know when you do a scene yeah oh i do this shit all the time i mean (laughs) this is like this is my side job you know what I mean? You've seen me in a lot of movies. You just don't realize it. Um, so you guys are a part of the Toronto Film Festival. For both of you, I mean, this is my favorite festival. I love this place. Uh, what does it mean for both of you to actually premiere here? A lot, because of course we're so honored. Um, when we heard that we were invited, we, I, I remember I was on vacation. I really screamed. I was so happy because, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, the city is great, but the festival is really, really nice. And everybody, you already were here uh, before. Uh, as an actress but everybody told me that the audience is so great that they're really movie lovers and we we very much experienced that yesterday yeah. i think with the questions we enjoyed the most of everything to do the q a after because that's the only way to find out what you know what a lot of audience members thought or what their analysis is or how they experienced it sure. so yeah. we've ex- we i think this is a great great festival people are so primal in their reactions that's why i so wanted to see the screening just you can you know if something something scary they'll be like oh you can actually hear their thoughts it's great because in 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 europe and especially northern europe our reactions are quite reserved even though we're you know we can be uh direct and we can be blunt but sometimes in the way we express our feelings it can be um a bit sort of you never really know. And sure. And that's, in, in North America, it's a completely different story. Well, it's uh, uh, it's also a completely different story. If you see a, a screening with, like, a lot of press, it's a little, sometimes it can be a little more quiet. Um, but I, uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe yesterday you guys, something announced that you guys are, are adapting or uh, got the rights to a World War II book. Um, yeah. So was it timed for yesterday or it just sort of came out yesterday? Um, no, it, we, we did a lot of interviews, of course, um, uh, for the movie, and then uh, and we we are already in the process of getting these rights for some time because a lot of people wanted these rights, <laughs> so we had to like really, you know, it was a whole process to get them, and we're very proud and very honored that it now we succeeded in optioning the rights. We we should actually mention what the title is and what it's yeah. about. So it's called The High Nest, and it's um, a novel or a, a book about a world war. World War Two about two sisters, Jewish sisters, and it's a beautiful book and it's written by uh, a, a woman in Holland. And the way it happened was like this: she moved into a villa in now in contemporary time, uh, outside of Amsterdam, beautiful villa in the woods, 
and she started to Cold reno- the high nest. Cold the high nest. And she started to renovate that place together with her husband. And then suddenly she started to find all these things behind walls, under the floor, clothing, uh, bits of music, that paper, m- written music on it and stuff like that. And then she's like, what's going on here? And then that's how she discovered this story of these two sisters. And so that's it's an incredible story and we're very proud. And now we're only beginning to sort of, you know, take it to another level and make it into something. I completely understand. So it's basically very early days. Super early days. I, I get it. Um, uh, my, I, the last few things for you. Uh, a little bit more fun, if you will. Um, if you guys could guest star. Do you watch any TV? Oh, yes. Okay, so if you could guest direct a TV show right now, wh- what yeah. TV show would it be? we both say the same thing. Euphoria. Yeah, 100%. Okay. I also think it needs more female directors, by the way. Although it's totally created by a guy who, who I think is the most incredible, I was gonna say, beautiful I, I, thing. I think the right answer is uh, everything should be 50-50. Cool. I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the right way to go. Uh, what movie have you seen the most? <laughs> Tootsie, I think. Ooh. The Piano Teacher by Hanukkah. Uh, have you guys ever been to Disneyland? Yep. No. Do you have a favorite ride at Disneyland? <sighs> I don't like Disneyland. I think it's like it's like Las Vegas for kids. It's like and, and also for, for adults me it's now. Like, sorry, well Disney and all your comics and it's all beautiful, but I mean, and I have a son, so I might you might see me there at some <laughs> point. But I think it's hell on earth. Right. I think if you go there and you have like some sort of a, a, a way to get to the front of the line easier, it's a different experience. I guess. I guess yes. Yeah. But I, I I get. I don't like big groups of people anyway and, uh, and these puppets that come up to you and, and I <laughs> um, is there anything that you collect collect yep yeah Bambi um, in, you know Bambi how do you say the little statues of Bambi sure or anything of Bambi Disney exactly <laughs> oh my god all quiet right yeah, I was like <laughs> I have a, uh, I, I'm a hoarder. I, I collect a lot of things, mostly shit. Like I have a lot of shit, the small things. I like ward, um, not wardrobes, um, robes, like um, bathrobes. Oh, that's. I have a, many of bathrobes. I don't know do why. Do you steal them from hotels? Use them. Sorry. Do you steal them from hotels? No, I have stolen a sheet. <coughs> Just one. Or two. Got in it. My, in my in my time. What was the last thing you guys were really obsessed with? Like a book, a movie, a performance, anything. I'm really obsessed by of, of Euphoria. How do you pronounce it properly? Can you you're pronounce f- it? You're f- you're f- you now you're making... Uh, I could have said it a second ago, and now I'm like, Euphoria. No, I'm totally obsessed. I'm like Googling. I'm like, f- I want to see now the Israeli version that it is based on. And I'm like, I cannot... It's For me, it's... Yeah, it's everything. I'm really obsessed with it. It's so funny, because yesterday, the writer of that show... No. Where is he? Ron something. He was he was supposed to be here, but he got sick. Because uh, he, he was here, they were coming in for a film called Incitement, which is this Israeli movie about the assassination. So he was the original, the original writer, probably. I think I don't know if he was the original creator or if he was the one who created. And he's also doing the American version. I don't. I didn't get to talk to him. So, but he was supposed to come in. Wow. FYI. Yeah. You could stalk him. He, he's around here. <laughs> I'm gonna stalk him. Yeah. Definitely today. I'm going to go and stalk him right now. What was the last thing you were obsessed with? Wow, okay. Okay, let's skip personal thing. If I skip personal shit, uh, I would say... um, (laughs) um, uh, I can only think of TV shows now, but yeah, I was really obsessed with Breaking Bad. Yeah, why wouldn't you be? It's been a a while, but... (laughs) You know that there's a Breaking Bad movie coming out next month. Yeah, I I know. (laughs) She's... (laughs) Yeah. Um, what uh, and not Euphoria, but is there a, what other TV show have you watched all the way through more than once? The Wire. <coughs> I've watched it three times. Everything. Do you have a favorite season? Three. Uh, the Office, the English one, the British one. Got it. Uh, do you own any movie or TV show props? What? Do you mean things that we did as actresses ourselves? No, it could also be shit you that you keep borrowed the from sets. That you had in that in that oh. film. No, all the Bambis I collect. I, I collect them mostly from sets because every art uh, art person will always think like, oh, they this this woman has a Bambi statue. That's that's how I started because I thought it was ridiculous that they were in every room of every person I played, the character. Is that true? Yeah, there's always a little Bambi somewhere, and now I have them. Are all. you sure it's so not like them. a rider in your contract? 
Yeah, maybe. I have to ask my manager. Maybe she puts it in there. I mean, seriously, that could explain a lot. <laughs> Did you keep anything? Because you have more uh, interesting Thermal props. underwear from the Game of Thrones. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, you can buy it anywhere, but I just uh, yeah stole some. Th that's the but, you know, Liam Cunningham, he has, prob he has a whole museum at his house of <laughs> stuff that he took, that he liberated. Right, exactly. By the way, if I, if I worked on a show like that, um, I would liberate or borrow plenty of things with every intention of bringing it back. Exactly. I mean, 100%. My, yeah. my last question for you guys. Do you remember what it was when you were younger that actually maybe flipped the switch in your brain about like, wow, I want to I do this. I want to work in movies or I want to... We have the same answer. Same, same answer. Annie. Really? Yep. Yes. And did you guys... Daddy Warbucks did it. <laughs> he did it. He fucked us over. It's all his fault <laughs> that we are sitting here with you right now. Was it... Was it which version of Annie? The, 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 the original. The Eileen Quinn, the, the movie. The, the, okay, the I want to make sure. Do you understand? You understand? <laughs> we right, were six or something. No, you're classics. <laughs> right, listen, I know exactly the movie. I can, I can see everything about it. That was Yul, Yul Brenner? Was it? No, it was. Who the, was? The woman was Eileen Quinn and Daddy Warbucks was, yeah, was um, uh, what's Albert Finney. Albert Finney. No, it was Albert. What am I and, saying? Uh, and what's your name? Carol Burnett. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, but you know, Carice so can actually, she won't do it because I asked her before, but she can actually, actually do like all the songs with props. She will get some props and she will do it right now. Towel. But she won't do I'll it for camera. I'll get a towel I and I go on the, on the floor. Maybe if we give her money. Polish. Wait, or can, if we give her really a trip to Walt Disneyland. Yeah. She can really do like a whole with the dance and everything. Really? Seriously? I'm not going to ask you to do no. it. No, but because she won't. But no, no, but that's amazing. Yeah. Um, well, mostly yeah. because you probably can do the whole movie, and most people can like quote a line or two from a film, you know. Like, uh, but apparently, we're talking. Su do you have the poster on the wall? No, I wish though. I, I did. I, I did for some time. I don't have it yeah. anymore. Yes, I did. I mean, do you guys have a production office? No, no, that's our home. Oh, I was going to say because yeah, if you work. had a production office, that should be the poster. Oh, I, I can wait to, to decorate our production idea. office. Let's get a production office just to get the poster up. I mean, this is like a no-brainer to me though, because if people ask, so be perfect. like, "This is what got us into doing yeah. what we're doing right now." Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is the no. This is the thing. You know, you need to also get one maybe with autographs on it. You need to go full force. Okay, yeah. let's you do know? that. That's a great idea. Uh, this is what I'm here for, thank and you. this is why I got paid today. Uh, listen, uh, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you uh, for having Congrats us. on your movie, for real. I'm so happy for you guys being part of the Toronto Film Festival, and um, good luck with everything in the future. Thank you thank so you. much. It was a very lovely conversation. Thank you. Ho hopefully it was not painful.